After the incredible success of Bird Box, Netflix has devised a sequel set halfway across the Earth. Where are we? Barcelona? <laughs> That's right, the city where such horror films as Wreck, The Orphanage, and Vicky Cristina Barcelona are set provides the backdrop for this sequel about monsters who want to be seen. So basically my ex-girlfriend. Now come along with me as we take a deep dive into the movie, its connection to the original, and why I'm never commuting to work. Uh-oh. Sounds like somebody's got a case of the Mondays. Meet Sebastian, an engineer hoping to save the world from climate change, and while he's not moonlighting as Greta Thunberg, he's raising his daughter, Anna. The film actually starts nine months after the world has gone to hell after an event simply known as The Problem. Mysterious entities, never given a name in the book or film, have taken over, causing anyone who looks at them to unalive themselves. And if you've seen the original, you know how these entities operate. They can't physically harm you, but instead cause people to experience intense hallucinations, culminating in suicidal behavior. That's got to hurt. I don't care where you're from. Now, there are some people who, instead of dying, turn into these crazed zealots hell-bent on making others open their eyes. Although never specifically stated what causes some to turn this way, it's heavily implied this may happen to individuals who are mentally ill or have experienced tremendous trauma, and as we follow Sebastian, this point will be made ever more clear. Sebastian's that cool dad. Even though he's risking their lives, he wants his daughter to enjoy some roller skating. For whatever reason, these entities can't enter buildings that are covered up, but the same can't be said for blind thieves who scavenge the Barcelonian city for scraps. Kinda like me drunkenly stumbling down Las Ramblas at 3am for shawarma. Sebastian and Anna come across a group of survivors who have creatively set up this shopping cart and rope system so they can easily find their way back to a giant bus terminal they've called home. Normally these survivors would be distrusting, but Sebastian, being an engineer, says he knows the location of a generator. Electricity would be considered a luxury, thus they take Sebastian in, but you may notice Anna isn't with him. This brings us to the first big twist of the movie. Sebastian is known as what's called a seer, one of those zealots I mentioned earlier whose goal is to get others to see the entities. These entities manipulate those around them to achieve this goal. Sebastian doesn't know where any of these generators are, he just wants to infiltrate this group and do whatever it takes to kill them. But in Sebastian's mind, he isn't killing them, he's saving Saving them. While the survivors are sleeping, he steals the keys to their bus and crashes it outside the building, leaving everyone in its wreckage prey to the entities. With each death, he sees a bright light leave their body, almost as if it's their souls going up to heaven. Claro, sus almas son libres. But there's one survivor, a man who stabbed his eyes out by the name of Lazaro. Sebastian doesn't kill him. The entities aren't interested in those who can't see. Earlier, when Lazaro recounts the story of losing his eyesight, he said the seers that came for him lost interest in him after he lost his sight. And when Sebastian had the opportunity to kill the blind thieves, Anna tells him not to do it. For whatever reason, those who are blind are of no interest to the entities. In Sebastian's mind, he's doing God's work, equating himself to a shepherd leading lost souls to God. In fact, there are several nods to shepherd imagery and wolf in sheep's clothing throughout the film. Now this voice telling him to do this manifests in the form of his dead daughter. Anna is but a figment of his imagination, created from trauma that happened roughly two months ago. Sebastian and Anna had been hiding in an apartment complex, but unbeknownst to them were tracked by a group of seers who saw the light from Sebastian's cake he scavenged for Anna's birthday. This is important because it ties into his guilt. If he had never lit that candle, perhaps they never would have been found and Anna would be alive today. This group of seers is led by a fanatic priest who believes the entities are ushering in an age of prophets and miracles. He wants Anna and Sebastian to see the beauty of God and to open their eyes. But when Anna is subjected to this quote-unquote beauty, she plummets to her death. Sebastian, on the other hand, is one of those lucky few who's turned into a seer. Now, at the end of the movie, we get a little more insight as to why some people turn into seers and others do not. A doctor at the mountain stronghold of Mont Juic, a place we'll see later on in the film, theorizes that extreme forms of stress can cause changes in the DNA. If this theory is correct, we can assume Sebastian, witnessing his own daughter unalive herself, caused him to change into a seer. These entities also appear to others in various forms, whether it be the sound of a loved one, like how Claire hears her brother Jack, 
Lillian, her lover, or Anna for Sebastian. But how do these entities know this? How do they take on these aspects to better manipulate us? There is one theory proposed by Octavio, a pizza delivery man with a degree in physics from the University of Mexico. He believes the entities are some sort of quantum being that constantly are changing to take on the forms of our greatest fears, grief, and pain. They can come in the form of aliens to some, demons to others, and in Sebastian's case, angels and God. And just a quick reminder before we move on, to close your eyes and hit that like and subscribe button, every little bit helps me stock up for the apocalypse. Before Sebastian became a seer, you could tell he was a religious man. He has a cross in his car, his daughter attends a Catholic school, and he gives Anna a special necklace for her first communion, one of a seraph. A seraph is a six-winged angel, which Sebastian calls the most beautiful of all. So the entities use Sebastian's already pre-established notions of God and angels to fuel his motivation for killing others. He sees the bright angelic lights come out of those he kills, so he truly believes he's doing God's work. But not everyone who is a seer sees it that way. He'll find this guy who describes the entities as aliens who have traveled millions of miles to get here and take us to the stars. <laughs> After culling the survivors at the bus terminal, Sebastian finds another group of survivors led by Dr. Claire Barnes, an English psychologist who ironically was on a book tour in Spain for her book, Age of Madness, How to Survive the Modern World. It's here we meet a lone German girl by the name of Sophia, and thanks to Sebastian knowing German from his work in the turbine fields, we learn that before she lost contact with her mother, a radio broadcast told of a refuge at Mont Jewett Castle, a fortified stronghold only accessible via Gondor. Now this crew doesn't know that Sebastian can freely see without being driven to suicide, giving him ample opportunity to appease the ghost of Anna who says that only by killing them can Sebastian be reunited with her. And so that night Sebastian frays part of the rope used to leash their dogs, causing absolute pandemonium on their travels to the gondola. Rafa, upon hearing the yelp from his dog, is tricked into taking his blindfold off and he gets himself a one-way ticket to heaven. Or at least that's what Sebastian thinks. While hiding in a nearby apartment, Claire tells Sebastian the story about her brother and how grief affected her. I can even admit to myself that he was dead. Grief can break you like that, you know? It's grief which isn't allowing Sebastian to admit to himself that Anna is dead. If he's going to overcome this control over him, he'll need to come to that realization. And this change occurs with the death of Octavio. While scouting the apartment for medicine, Sebastian leaves the window open and calls in Octavio, telling him it's safe to take off his blindfold, allowing the entity to drive Octavio to madness. But when he dies, Sebastian doesn't see his soul travel toward heaven. This is his first step into overcoming the entity's hold on him. Even after Anna demands that Sebastian rip off Claire's blindfold to kill her, he resists, having an internal struggle. <laughs> Soon, Sebastian's treachery is revealed, and Claire finds out his glasses are fake. He can actually see through them. But with Father Esteban and his men hot on their tails, Claire will have to trust Sebastian in order to escape. They make their way to the gondola, where Sebastian holds off the priest as Claire and Sophia make their way up the tower. All this time, Sebastian believed he was responsible for the death of his daughter, but now he's come to the realization that he was so overcome with grief that it broke him. Grief can break you. I thought it was chosen, but it was just broken. Even as the ghost of his dead daughter leaps over the flaming car to get to Sebastian, he does not budge. This is his chance at redemption. By saving Claire and Sophia, it's one small step towards mending the errors of his past. Even Claire saving Sophia is an act of redemption, as Claire feels responsible for leaving behind her mentally ill brother, Jack. She won't leave Sophia behind. The gondola tower itself is surrounded by birds. In fact, bird imagery can be seen throughout the film, from Anna's nightlight to bird's tested at the research facility. By ringing this massive bell, Claire alerts the soldiers at the castle and must perfectly time their jump into the gondola to make their escape. Meanwhile, Sebastian stabs his daughter with a steel rod, symbolic of him finally letting go of her. But like most of her in this film, it was a figment of his imagination, and the real person he stabbed was none other than the evil priest, who, with his last dying strength, plunges Sebastian into the rod too. The last we see of him, he's staring up to the sky at the birds above. We never actually see him die, 
but his wound seems pretty bad for him to pull through. Meanwhile, Claire and Sophia arrive at the castle, which indeed is a safe refuge. It reminded me a lot of the ending to the first bird box, coming into this safe place. Fresh produce are grown through drapes in the sky, and life seems to thrive here, as opposed to the unforgiving streets below. Sophia is reunited with her mother, who most thought to be dead. But before Claire can join the group, she must undergo some tests. The scientists here have devised a DNA test to tell whether someone carries the mutated seer gene, and they believe that this DNA could be the key to creating immunity. Claire also tells them that it's possible to reach the seers and turn them back to normal. She witnessed this herself with Sebastian. These two new details open up a world of possibility for future Bird Box movies. Now, it's important to note that the events of this movie take place nine months after the entities arrive, while the original has events that take place five years after, so we can assume that there is still no cure or solution to this problem five years after the entities arrive. At least Bird Box Barcelona leaves us with the possibility of some sort of cure. The final scene gives us a glimpse into this testing. We have what is believed to be a seer whose blood is being synthesized and tested on these rats. According to the doctors, this is the 12th test, with their last one managing to hold off an entity for 48 seconds. So I guess you could say they're at least making progress. Inside the containment room, they have somehow managed to capture an entity. They never explain how it was captured, but that's a question I would love to see answered in any future installments of the franchise. But what did you think of Bird Box Barcelona? Does it live up to its predecessor? I want to hear your thoughts and theories below. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe. And for more bad takes, you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram at ThinkStoryYT. Until next time, remember, where are we? Barcelona? <laughs>